Hey everyone, welcome to Pega Heart. I'm Srikant, working as a lead Pega developer based out of Sydney, Australia. And you are in the right place if you want to learn Pega concepts. Hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you are the first to know if I upload anything new. And if you like the video, hit the like button and share it with your friends. So today we are going to learn a deep dive about job scheduler how to configure that, what is a job scheduler, the detail level uh, of the job scheduler and you know where to trace, how to do error handling, we're going to talk about everything. It is a theoretical session but I'm going to give you each and every detail of it here and I'm going to have another video where I'm going to do it as a practical session where I'm going to run a job scheduler and show you how does it work. So now before I proceed further, the first thing that I would like to ask you is what is a job scheduler? Now, as you guys know, a job scheduler, the, the name itself indicates that you are scheduling a job. That means a human would not do that. It's an automated job, right? Now, we are using job scheduler day -to -day, in our day-to-day -day life, right? Now, for example, the best example that I can give you is job scheduler being used in the mobile phone. Now, let's say if you are setting a reminder every month to pay out the rent. So, that means you are using, obviously, job scheduler wherein you are kind of setting a reminder and you don't need to do it again and again. The system reminds you, the phone reminds you. Similarly, where you set the alarm uh, to get up every day at 7 am, right? So you do that one time and then system does that. Now, similarly, during our project, we also use job scheduler for multi-purpose. These are some of the examples that we use. For example, you are processing some task every night. It was a requirement that you have to process some task every night. That means obviously you would not be there to process that manually, right? That's uh, not fair and uh, and there is no reason why you should be using Pega to do that. That's why Pega has given the job scheduler to do that. Similarly, let's say you need to purge and archive or delete those uh, resolve cases, right? Let's say a bigger application, every day you create like, you know, thousands of applications. You can't keep them as is, right? So as and when the application grow, you need to start purging automatically. So you can create a job scheduler for that. Let's say if you are uh, going to, uh, if you got a requirement wherein you need to expire those untouched cases. When I say untouched cases that you created, but you never went back and again try to close that or something, then obviously what we can do is we'll see, let's say if a requirement is like, if 20 days I haven't touched the case, then delete it. Then obviously you can create a job, job scheduler, which does the job. Similarly, let's say if you've got a requirement wherein you need to send out a report in every, uh, like, you know, uh, Friday evening, 7 uh, p.m., then what you can do is you can configure a job scheduler to do the same. So these are the couple of examples or use cases, I would say, wherein we use the job scheduler. Now let's understand the state diagram, you know, how does that work on a very high level, okay? The first thing if you see here, when uh, you create a job scheduler, the system uh, um, identify the job scheduler and then what system does is there is a requester type called async processor where system engage that requester type for your job scheduler to be triggered. Now, once the job scheduler triggered, then what we do is job scheduler calls an activity which actually does the business logic. Right now, job scheduler is just a medium wherein it triggers an activity to do the logic. Right now, uh, here I talked about async processor requester type. Right, I obviously haven't described the requ all the requester type that Pega has. It's a it's a different session altogether because there are a lot of learning in that, which I'm gonna make another video. But here, because uh, I told that there is a requester type called async processor, I'm gonna give my two cents over here to make you understand first what is a requester type. Now, first to navigate a requester type, right? You need to go to record system admin and requester type. Now, this is where you're gonna get the requester type, and you can you will find five different requester type. Now, the first requester type that uh, is browser. So, when the requester type browser comes into picture, when you are trying to log in Pega from the web browser, you know where whatever I show the login page, it it actually goes via browser requester type. Now, the second one is portal. So Pega has got a lot of portlets, which you can, uh, you know, uh, use the moment you log into Pega, you can use those portlets. Now, if you are using those portlets, then you can go via portal uh, requester type. I mean, not you can, Pega has created those requester type to do that certain job. Similarly, you've got a requester type called app. When it will uh, come into picture, when let's say you expose a service to the external party and then external system using Pega services to retrieve information or do something, then Pega uses app requester type. 
and the third one the fourth one is the batch request attack when pega executes certain task internally in a batch processing manner and the last one is async processor and it is purely for triggering job scheduler and queue processor so basically pega define those requested type so that this kind of uh, requested type can be used depending on the way or the nature uh, of the requester who logs into pega or try to access the information in different media so this is this is a short note of requested type but i promise i'm going to create another video and uh, going to explain you detail about the requested type now let's move to the next one wherein we're going to talk about detail of a job scheduler now first thing is you need to understand where to find job scheduler right to create you need to find so you need to go to record system admin and job scheduler that's where you're going to find the job scheduler now remember job scheduler is a version rule that means you need to have a rule set version and rule set name to create a job scheduler it's not a data instance now the second point is the moment you create a job scheduler irrespective of any application you would find that as part of rule hyphen async hyphen job scheduler class so if you click click there jo your job scheduler name will be an instance of this specific class the third point which you need to consider right you created a job scheduler it's not a manual right somebody has to automatically uh, trigger this one that somebody is nothing but your system but how the system know which one to trigger at what point because system has to access that job scheduler right now to access that job scheduler you got two option now option one is you when you create a job scheduler you will find a system runtime context so in pega you have a system runtime context you need to ensure that your application is being part of the system runtime context so that pega would understand that this job scheduler would be triggered or this configuration pega would understand and uh, i would show you while i'm doing the practical wherein where to find this and how to see all the application now option 2 that we have is define the access group in async processor requester type right? like i told pega the moment you create a job scheduler pega uses async request processor requester type right what you can do is if you go to the requester type which i already told and you click on the async requester type you can find pega async processor requester type and in that async requester type you will find an access group being attached now that a access group will be default prpc async processor when you create a job scheduler you would have defined to a rule set right and a version that means if you give an access group which has got uh, access to that rule set and version that means access to that specific application where that rule set uh, name and version has been defined that means automatically when pega triggers this async processor requester type async processor will take that access group go to the job scheduler try to read the activity and do the job so these are the two options you need to ensure if your job scheduler is not running after you configuring make sure you check these two option to ensure that it is part of that system context or you have defined the access group i hope this is clear the next one is about when you create a job scheduler what all you need to uh, understand the first thing is the first option is associated with node type so i'll probably take a minute to explain about node right now if i am doing some job in my personal edition or some task in my personal edition that means i have actually installed a personal edition in my laptop right that means i have actually installed a tomcat server in my laptop that means i have got a single node uh, uh, pega server now this is my personal edition that's why it is single node application but in real time in, in a bigger organization obviously the volume of the job will be more you need more server to handle those volume so that's why in the real time production environment you will have multi node when i say multi node you will have multiple server now the same that that uh, multiple server is going to connect to a single database and on top of it there will be a load balancer the moment you call the load balancer generally what we do when a request come it goes to the load balancer load balancer determine depending on the server availability load balancer determine which server it will send the request now that server will execute and then store into the same database so that no matter from which server you read from the database your data will be synced a node type can be potential web user can be background processing can be search and can be bigs my personal edition node type is actually having all the thing i cannot differentiate because i've got a single node but in a larger organization let's say if you got six nodes then what you can do is maybe you can define four nodes as web user bigs and search and dedicated the two nodes you can keep it for background processing so that you can kind of trigger this job scheduler 
The second option which you need to focus is when I choose the associated with node type as background processing, then it will ask me whether you want to run on an any associated node or all associated nodes. I can create job schedule for multi-purpose, right? I can create for uh, purpose A, purpose B. Now let's say for any purpose you create the job scheduler, if you understood that the volume for that purpose is going to be less, then obviously there is no point of running that in all nodes. You, you should always run that in any associated node. But if you know for any purpose you're creating the job scheduler, it is going to be, uh, you know, loading, it is going to be overloaded to the server, then obviously you need to use the all associated mode so that the load will be, um, you know, divided into multiple server and then your performance will be high. The next thing is what kind of schedule that you can do for a job scheduler. So there are uh, on a very high level, there are three different type of schedule. One is your startup. That means, for example, well, let's say if your node is down, right? And every time the node is up, uh, up and running, then you want to send an email to the ops team. That is point number one. Point number two, you know, all the data pages that we have in the node level, that means every node, every server that is there, the data pages exist. But the moment the server goes down, that means the data page is going to uh, um, clear that uh, entire database, right? You can't access that. Now, um, when the node is back up and running, so what happened is, the node level database will first run when you reference from your code. But if you got a requirement, let's say, you need to get ready of all the data pages running on the node level before even somebody triggers a request. That means every time the server uh, comes up online, right? You will trigger all those data pages to keep all the data in the node level to use them and in your application. So during that time, you can do also startup. The second option is multiple times a day. Let's say if I have a requirement where I'm going to tell uh, that I need to send report in every five hours or every two hours. That means this is where you can say multiple times a day and you can choose here in the drop down. You can choose hours, minute on end second, depending on the requirement. The third one is the recurring classic example that um, which I have already given. Let's say if I had to send an email every Friday 7 a.m., then I'm going to do is recurring wherein I'll say, OK, every week. Friday 7 p.m. is when I'm going to send an email. So you can configure that recurring one. Now, the next option that uh, is context. Now, in context, you've got two options. One is use system runtime context, which I already explained that when you use system runtime context, you need to make sure that uh, your application is being part of the system runtime context. So if you see this job scheduler is being part of a rule set called PZ Hurt Learning and the version is 010101, right? This job scheduler is in a locked rule set or isn't part of the uh, specific rule set version. Now, if I want the system to access this job scheduler, obviously, or uh, obviously I need system to know where my job scheduler sits, right? Now, this is where it will help me, right? Now, what I can do is I can say, okay, use system runtime context and in that system runtime context, I will say, okay, um, uh, my application is XYZ, it's present. So uh, uh, when Pega um, uh, triggers the job scheduler, they'll use the async uh, requester type and then they can access the job scheduler and also the activity which I'm going to talk about in a minute. If you do not want or if you do not have that as part of system runtime context, then what you can do is you can always specify an access group. Now, this job scheduler, you know, it is dedicated for your application because obviously you have, uh, you know, chosen your application rules certain version. Now, it is the best idea that you can define your access group specific for uh, uh, this job scheduler. Uh, I mean, this is uh, here. I have just used the author, but you can create a different one like batch or something just for your application and you can use. Now, the next one, which I uh, wanted to tell about the business logic. Who does the business logic for a job scheduler is the activity. Now activity does all the business logic, right? Now here you got two options. One is the class option. Another one is activity option. Now class option defined. You need to put the class name where the activity has been created. Now, if you, uh, if you, if you understand now, let's say if I have written an activity to execute an activity, what does I do? I do act, uh, action and run right now exactly what job scheduler is doing so that it goes to that activity and it runs that activity now let's move to the next one 
now when you write an activity you would have you know uh, handle the error you make sure that you know all the uh, potential error has been handled in that activity and job schedule capture that now to see them what you need to do is you need to first go to admin studio resources and jobs so anybody who is using so i'm using 8.6 version anybody who is using uh, you know 8 and above you will have the admin studio now in the admin studio you go to resources and job you will find the job scheduler the moment you um, go to this uh, landing page then you will find all the job scheduler uh, which is running over here so here the first column is uh, the job names the second column you define the job scheduler which is for like let's say every day one hour or uh, every day 7 pm or something like that so it will tell how much um, time it took to execute and the the configuration wherever you uh, did it will tell when the job scheduler ran last time and then when is the next run let's say if i do every uh, day one hour every every one hour it has to run that means um, it would have been run like 5 6 uh, 16 5 23 8 11 so the next run will be 9 11 right now here if you see i have done every five minutes just for testing and all then that's why it has got like five minutes now similarly what you have got is uh, the um, execution so how many time it got executed so for example here it shows a number 87 the moment you click on 87 you would it will take to another landing page wherein you would find all the uh, you know entries of uh, the run time it will tell you the start time end time duration and everything so there is a status um, uh, column which is very important which will tell whether it's a success one or it's a failure failed one now let's say if it is a failed one obviously you, there is an exception column where you uh, where system records all the failure reasons and you can click and un try and understand what is the failure let's say in an event where a job scheduler is failed and you want to make sure you first correcting that failure reason before even you uh, trigger the next run so what you can do is you can always override the job scheduler now the default uh, state of job scheduler is going to be enabled and you'll have an override option the moment you click on this override it will make the job schedule as disabled and obviously you'll have reward so in a uh, uh, situation where you got a failed job scheduler and the failure reasons are unknown right if it is a known reason that's a different story but if the failure reasons are unknown then obviously you need to stop the job scheduler to ensure that it doesn't fail again and again and then you try to find the root cause so until you find the root cause you come and disable this and then once it is done you overwrite that i hope this is clear and this is another important thing how you can um, you know uh, do the trace and uh, sorry do the error handling the last bit which i wanted to talk about is how to trace a job scheduler so when you want to trace a job scheduler go to the job scheduler and there will be three button at the end of the job scheduler name and the moment you click on you can do a trace there is another way you can also trace which i haven't captured over here is each job scheduler calls that activity right but calling that activity activity is a standalone so you can always go to action and uh, action and trace for that activity to trace the job scheduler i hope you uh, understood the job scheduler very clearly this is a purely theoretical part but i want you to understand each and every aspect so that while doing practical i can only uh, you know focus on executing the job scheduler and I am going to show you each and everything, whatever I have explained you, but please make sure you understand this concept. The moment you understand the concept, that's where you can, you know, uh, configure the job scheduler in a better way.